Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to our study on Hebrews that we did. We Well, we started it last night, actually. I think it was about about six last night we got on here and we started reading through Hebrews. And we got through all of chapter one and then about halfway through chapter two. And that's where we left off because we, we were kind of getting to... Um, kind of hitting that 40 minute mark and, and you guys had left a lot of comments so we kind of cut it short a little bit in uh in chapter two there so that's where we are going to pick up today um just a couple of quick announcements you may have noticed the uh the background has changed here a little bit in case you weren't here last night that is actually because uh, my wife and i are in the process of moving and my desk is in the moving truck along with all of my things that i normally have so we are camping out on the floor here uh, sitting where my desk used to be and we're pretty much going to be in here for the entire week. Um, the other thing about being on the floor is that the dogs think I'm down here to play with them. So they're definitely going to be popping into the videos sporadically throughout our discussion today. Um, so anyway, that being said, let's jump back to where we left off, which I think was Hebrews 2.8. Hey, buddy, you lay down? Okay. Hey, all right, that's a good boy. I think it was Hebrews 2.8 that we left off on. So um, we talked about, uh, just kind of recapping, the first chapter of Hebrews was about the Jews and how they, um, about how they, they kind of regarded angels very, very highly. They were kind of worshiping angels almost a little bit, or at least they, they thought very highly of them. And the author of Hebrews was, was uh, making this argument that, hey, Jesus is so far superior to the angels. This son of God, he's not a servant of God in the sense that angels are servants. He's actually far superior to them. So that was really the crux of chapter 1. In chapter 2, he kind of ends that argument, and then he starts talking. He's going to start describing Jesus a little bit more. So going on here, let's start in verse 10. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Isn't that interesting that um, Scripture says two different times, both in the book of Hebrews, that Jesus was made perfect. Here it's saying he was made perfect through what he suffered. Now, it's interesting because wouldn't he already have been perfect? Why is he being made perfect? There's also scripture that says Jesus was declared the son of God uh, by his resurrection. He was declared the son of God then. Um, but wasn't he the son of God before? Wasn't that what he was saying before? So here's how I interpret that. This is my opinion on it. As far as declared the Son of God by his, his being resurrected from the dead, I think that's just a matter of, yes, Jesus is who he says he is. Because if he wasn't the Son of God, he would still be in that tomb. So, yes, he, is, he was declared the Son of God by his resurrection from the dead. That's how I read those bits of scripture. That um, Some of them will say appointed the Son of God. Jesus was appointed as the Son of God. I think Paul says that. That's how I read that. Is is yeah? Yes, this is now the proof. He was not a fraud. He was not crazy. He wasn't a liar. Uh, he was the Son of God, and he has proven that by his resurrection from the dead. Um, as far as being made perfect, because we have that twice, Jesus was made perfect through what he suffered. The author of Hebrews says, the way that I read that is that he was made perfect to us as the perfect Savior, the perfect intercessor, the perfect uh, propitiation for us as the children of God. I think that that's the context that's being used here. We know Jesus would not have needed to be made perfect in the sense that we did need. We needed to be made perfect. Us, the children of God, um, we were made perfect through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all time. That's what Hebrews 10, 14 says, um, which that is coming later. So we needed to be made perfect because we were previously imperfect. Um, but that is not the case with the Son of God. I read that as he was made perfect to us. He is the perfect Lamb of God because of what he did. Um, perfect to us. That's, that's how I interpret that. So uh, uh, going down here, um, where do we see that? Um, yet at present, um, Jesus was made lower than from the angels for a little while. Now, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. I'm backing up to verse. I forgot about verse nine. Um, so so he, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. What does that mean? We, you know, we hit on this when we did our highlights of Hebrews uh, live stream, but it's a really important verse. Because death is actually that, that separation from God uh, caused by sin. And here the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus tasted that for everyone. He tasted that separation from God that is caused by sin. Um, he tasted that so that you would never have to. He experienced separation from the Father so that you would never have to because of sin. We have, we have this in the Synoptic Gospels. We have Jesus on the cross and... Um, it, um, it part of he's he's been up there for a, a bit, but he he cries out, "My God, my God, why have you forsaken me?" 
And there's the incorrect interpretation of that, which is teaming that up with some scripture from Habakkuk, specifically um, Habakkuk chapter 1, where Habakkuk the prophet says that God's eyes are too holy to look upon sin. And traditionally, that's been misunderstood. and said that God had to turn away from Jesus. He had to look away. Oh my gosh, I can't look uh, because of sin. That's, that's the incorrect interpretation of that. I think the correct interpretation was is that sin does, in fact, separate humanity from God, and Jesus was tasting that for everyone. He was tasting that separation so that we would never have to. That's, what, that's, that's exactly what God had warned Adam about in the garden. Uh, that's exactly what he had warned him about. If you eat from the tree, you will surely die. The, the death that God spoke of had a, had a weightier meaning to it. We know it wasn't physical death because Adam's heart didn't seize up the second he ate some of the fruit, you know, as, as if it was poisonous. That's not what happened. He lived another nine centuries after that incident. So he did not die immediately. He didn't die for a very long time after that. But the death God was speaking of was not physical death. It's spiritual death. It's you're going to die. You're going to be separated from God. You're going to experience that separation that is caused by sin. So Adam was the one who ushered that in. Christ is the one who ushered that out by his death. He tasted that on behalf of everyone. That is now gone. There is no separation between us and our Father. There will never be separation between us and our Father, us the children of God. Um, we don't have sin that would separate us from, from God. That's, that's what's so erroneous about all these teachings that we have that are just rampant in our Christian churches that sin separates us from God. That is the Old Testament. That is the Old Covenant. That has never been the New Covenant. Uh, what, what those teachings do is they're ignoring the Son of God. They're completely ignoring Jesus Christ. They're ignoring that he himself came. He tasted that on our behalf, and we will never experience that. We are in Christ who is in the Father. Um, we are all one, as the Gospel of John says. It also says, Jesus says, anyone who loves me will be loved by my Father, and we will come to that person and make our home with that person. We are the temple of the living God. We cannot get closer and more in union with God than we are, and... Sin, sin has no place in that. The children of God um, are in Christ, and in him there is no sin. That's been wiped out by the Lamb of God. So that's what this scripture is uh, talking about here. And then later on, the author of Hebrews is really going to really uh, dig into this, too, and really explain the sacrifice of Christ. Um, so going down here, uh, it says, both the one who, let me switch over to New American Standard for verse. Um, I'm going to read it to you. Let me read it to you in NIV, and then I want to switch it over to New American Standard, because I think they say this a little bit better. NIV says in verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Let's look at that exact same verse in uh, New American Standard. It says, both he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are all from one father. For this reason, he is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. The reason I prefer New American Standard there is because it says sanctified. NIV is not wrong. Made holy is what sanctified means. They're translating that and they're plugging that right into the text. Both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy. It's really the same thing. The reason I like the, the, the versions that use the word sanctified there is because of all the attacks on sanctification. Um, all the attacks on that and saying that this is progressive and this is happening over over your entire life. And, and no, that's not the case. Um, he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified. So he who sanctifies being Jesus Christ, those who are sanctified being me and you are all from one father. The cool thing about the new covenant is it's a family dynamic. Um, it's, it's all a family dynamic. God is our father. Jesus is our older brother. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters is what this is saying because we have the same dad. That's why he's calling us brothers and sisters. It's because we, we are. We're siblings. We have the same dad. Um, but we have that same holiness, too, that Jesus has. And that's because of what he did on our behalf. He's given us that. Um, he has sanctified us once for all time, not over the course of our life. It has absolutely nothing to do with behavior. That's the other thing. They'll say, well, your actions and attitudes are being sanctified. It's fine if you want to say that. Because we do have scripture that says things like, um, be holy, be um, Therefore, um, as, as God is holy, I think First Peter says that. Um, be holy in, in all your behavior, specifically, I think is what he says. It's one of my live quotations. I think specifically he says, be holy in all your behavior. So I understand how you could say your actions and attitudes are being sanctified. I would never, ever, ever say it that way because of all the confusion that comes with it. Um, and then we, we, it, it negates the fact that we already have been sanctified. We have been made holy um, once for all time, and we're 
I think if you have two versions of sanctification that you're teaching, the once for all and then the being sanctified, when you're really just talking about maturing, um, I don't like that so much. I think that's going to lead to confusion. They're going to get blurred. And that's what we've done. We've blurred these. Um, to, to sanctify uh, means to make holy. NIV is right about that. Saint uh, means holy person, holy one. Saint is the end result of being sanctified. They're part of the same word. Um, the children of God are, are holy. We are holy. We have to be if we're the temple of the living God. Uh, we've, we've, we've talked about the Holy of Holies before. Uh, you know, the Holy of Holies, you have, you have the inner sanctuary, the Ark of the Covenant. That's where the Holy Spirit, uh, that's where his abode in the, um, in the Old Testament, in the Old, um, in the old Covenant. That's, that's where the Holy Spirit lived, it was in this Holy of Holies. But here's the thing. The Holy Spirit lives within us now. And the children of God, he lives within our hearts. Um, that, that's his new abode. We are the temple of the living God. So whenever, I've had this conversation a couple times with brothers and sisters who do not believe that Christians are holy. They're not. They say that's a terrible thing to say, that we're holy, that we're holy like Jesus. What a horrible thing to say. I'll take them through the Old Testament a little bit. And I'll say, so the Holy Spirit had to be behind a curtain, separated from, from mankind, because that's how holy he was and how unholy everyone else was. And we know what would happen if you walked into the presence of the Holy of Holies without the proper sanctification rituals. We know what would happen. Okay, you're dead. Um, you're completely dead. So we must at least be as holy as the most holy place, as, the, as Christians, as the children of God. We are at least that holy as the most holy place because we are the new most holy place. We are the most holy place now because we, we carry the Holy Spirit around within us. So we're at least that holy. Um, and then I kind of continue by arguing, okay, but we're actually a lot more holy than that because that was achieved by animal blood. And it's impossible for the blood of goats and bulls to take away sins. So our holiness comes through the blood of Christ. How much greater is that holiness than what was, what was offered in the Old Testament? So the children of God are holy. Uh, scripture says that a bunch of times. Here's one of them, and this is a really particularly good one. So let me jump back to NIV. I think it's a little bit more readable, but I just wanted you guys to hear that in the New American Standard. Um, so, uh, so Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. That's Jesus talking about, um, he, so he's saying that to God. He's saying, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. Um, that closeness. It is just so cool, the way that that's structured right there. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I in the children God has given me. And it's talking about us. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is, the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So, so the power of the devil was broken at the cross, and he's saying by his death, by the death of Christ, the power of the devil was, was broken in two. Colossians says that too. It says that the devil was disarmed at the cross. Um, he lost his power then. The claim that he had on humanity was sin. That was, that was, the, that was the claim. That was his whole thing. Is he, he could accuse us based on sin. So what about the accuser of the brethren? I, I hear this all the time. The devil's the accuser of the brethren. He accuses them day and night. I don't agree with that. I hear that all the time. All the time I hear that from New Covenant teachers. Here's why I don't agree with that. Revelation chapter 12, which is where that comes from, says that the accuser of the brethren was thrown down at the cross. Um, he, he lost his position in heaven. There was no longer a place found for him in heaven. And it talked about why that was. And it says he was overcome by the blood of the lamb. He lost his position because of the blood of the lamb as the accuser of the brethren. So I don't agree with when um, I, hear, I hear this a lot that, oh, well, the devil accuses us day and night. Um, he doesn't. That was up until the cross. The only thing he could accuse us of is sin. But we don't have sin. In fact, the propitiation was for the entire world wasn't just for the children of God. It was actually for everyone. Um, so as far as, 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 does the devil have a place in heaven anymore where he can actually stand there and point his finger at you and say, no, no, you know, this part, you know, Jeremiah did this, Jeremiah did that. No, I, I don't, I don't agree with that. I think that he lost that position. He, his power was broken, as the author of Hebrews is saying here. He was disarmed. Um, but, you know, Revelation, I mean, how much do you want to read into that? You know, is, are, are these describing actualities? Is this symbolic? Um, that's really open to interpretation. That's my interpretation of it. I do not have the gift of interpreting prophecy, so that's how I see it. That does not mean that that is 
the accurate rendering of that. To me, I struggle with the idea of an active accuser of the devil, an actor accuser of us, the children of God, when our righteousness comes from Christ and our holiness comes from Christ. In my opinion, he would have to point his finger at Jesus and say he did that. He didn't sanctify them all the way. He, it would have to be an accusation toward Jesus because we're in Christ. And that's, that's where I struggle so much with this accuser of the brethren stuff. And I'm like, well, that, it, it definitely does say that, but then he, was, he lost his place because of, because of Jesus. He lost his place in heaven. Um, so so that, those are my thoughts on that. Um, and I think that that's kind of what the author of Hebrews is saying here. Um, the devil once held the power of death. Death being that separation from God caused by sin. The, de- the devil once had that power. He had that power, um, but he doesn't anymore because of uh, because of the Son of God broke that. So, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. So, being held in slavery by your fear of death, what would that mean? Well, knowing that death is separation from God, you're held in slavery by being afraid of being separated from God. This could be talking about the Hebrew people who, to who this letter is written because everything with the Old Covenant was separation from God. The entire um, system you had there, the tabernacle and all the way that that was set up was God separating himself from people, um, separating them because of sin. You had the offerings that would take place at the tabernacle and later on the temple, but the problem is that they never could take away sin. If they could have, the author of Hebrews will later, later tell us this, if they could have taken away sin, they would have been offered one time. You would have had one, one lamb would have been offered and that would have been that. And you would have never had another one because all sin would have been taken away. But we know they were insufficient because that never happened. And day after day, year after year, they had to present these offerings, which could never take away sins. So that separation was always present. Thus, that fear of death that the devil held was always a thing. So when he says that these people lived their whole lives in slavery to fear of death, fear of being separated from God, I think it could be talking about that. Of course, it would be that. Of course, it could be that because that's the whole system is being separated from God. Now, unfortunately, since we um, do not do not preach the cross in our churches. We do not preach once for all forgiveness, once for all sanctification, all the things that the New Testament preaches. We don't preach those. So the problem becomes that Christians, the children of God, if they are in Christ, if they are in fact in Christ, if they've believed in Jesus, live in slavery from um, their fear of death. They do that because we teach that any sin that you commit separates you from God. Um, something that cannot be found anywhere in the New Testament. And we have the opposite of that. We have the opposite teachings uh, toward that. So we don't have any teachings that say that. We have a ton that don't. We ignore all of those. We created man-made doctrines based on the opinions of theologians and past uh, teachers that were respected. And we've come up with this, this goofy system that is so far worse than what they had in the Old Testament that every sin separates you from God and you have to go to him and ask for this forgiveness and have this, this fellowship restored and all this junk that we never see anywhere. Um, Now you could describe Christians who are under that slavery as a slavery of a fear of of death. Um, They're living in slavery of the fear of death. The very thing that the Son of God set them free from. The devil has... He lost his power because it says here his power was broken. He held the power of death, but it was broken. So at one point he could actually enforce this, but now he can't. So now he can lie and tell you that he still can enforce it. Um, It's kind of like... You, have you ever seen those those old uh, and any a lot of old shows from like the fifties and, and things like that? I, I grew up watching um, a lot of that stuff. Um, you ever see someone pretend they had a gun, like they'd have like a trench coat on and they'd stick their finger through the pocket and pretend they had a gun? You ever you ever see anything like that on um, in, on in any movie, any TV show where they're 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 lying, they're pretending they have a gun and they're trying to scare somebody with their finger and, and saying they have a gun? That's the devil. That's how he is now. He used to have one. He used to have an actual weapon. He used to hold the power of death. And now he's trying to convince you that he has the power of death. (laughs) But he doesn't. Um, There is no separation for the children of God from our Father. That's how it is now. Uh, So, so... That's, that's what that's talking about there. And unfortunately, um, we've gone back to verse 15, um, living in slavery of fear of death because we don't understand the gospel in so many of our churches. Uh, so in, in verse 16 here, now this is interesting. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make propitiation for the sins of the people. So verse 16, for surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. Um, I wanted to touch a little bit. I'm going to jump over to Galatians chapter 3. 
So he's kind of ending his argument about angels there. And he's like, it's not to angels. His ministry is not to angels, but to Abraham's descendants. Um, that's actually us. We're actually just the descendants of Abraham, us, the children of God. When um, God told Abraham that he would have many children, he would, he would have that, you know, we, many sons. And I think we have a Sunday school song about that. Um, that was actually talking about the, um, the spiritual family that was going to come through the Son of God, through the firstborn of God and, and then the people that he was going to sanctify. Uh, Paul says here in Galatians 3, 7, he says, Understand then that those who have faith are the children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. So that's us. So we, we have that faith. We are blessed. Um, we are the, we are the um, people, the descendants of Abraham that he was promised is actually the children of God. So Abraham's descendants, um, what does uh, Paul say? I think it's, is it Romans 10? No, it can't be 10 because that's about the salvation. It's in the later chapters of Romans and he says, It is not as though God's word has failed. For not all who descend from Israel are Israel, nor because are they are they Abraham's descendants? Um, uh, that, and he says in another way, what I'm saying is it's not about physical descent, um, but it's about faith. It's the faith makes you the children of Abraham. So he, he kind of like, he kind of fleshes that out a little bit more in Romans. So that's what Abraham's descendants, that's when he's saying that the author of Hebrews is saying that he's speaking specifically about the children of God. Uh, verse 17 is interesting. He had to be made like them fully human in every way in order that he may become a merciful and faithful high priest. Um, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Um, in order to really, I think, I think this is what he's saying here. You guys, tell me if you have different thoughts on this. Um, he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest. I think that he had to, he had to kind of get in humanity's shoes a little bit, so he could, he could be perfectly relatable to them. That's why I'm reading that. Um, because the children had flesh and blood, he had to be made like them. Um, so he, he, could, he could be the perfect high priest because he was one of us. Um, that, that's how I'm reading that, is that, that he, would have, he would have a perfect understanding of the struggles of humanity because he himself was, was human. Um, and it says, you know, here in verse 18, because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. He's relatable. He's, he himself has been tempted. He knows what that's like. He knows those struggles. Um, and he, he, he had the thoughts and that's, that's a, um, something I want to touch on too, when it comes to sins and, uh, and, and thoughts and how, how every, every, uh, thing is a sin, you know, in our Christian teachings, everything is a sin and every, every little sin is separating you from God. And we've all been down that horrible road, but, uh, fact of the matter is it's, it's really the actions I, I believe because Jesus has been tempted in every single way, um, when those thoughts were presented to him, or maybe more directly, as he was actually spoken to by the devil, however that worked, uh, he, he did consider carrying out these actions. You know, the devil is telling him, he, Jesus is starving. He's, he's nearly starved to death. Uh, and G the devil says to him, why don't you make bread out of these stones? And Jesus had the thought of, what if I do make bread out of these stones? You know, he, he would have had the thought. He would have processed that thought. He didn't do it. And that's when it would have been sin, as if he had done it, but he didn't do it. Um, he was tempted in every way, yet he never sinned. So the thought, the thought about doing the incorrect thing is never sin. Um, that's wrong. If that's the case, then Jesus sinned. Um, I guess quite frequently then, because he was tempted in every single way. So the thought of doing the wrong thing is not, is not sin in, a, in and of itself. I was taught that my whole life. Oh, your sinful thoughts, you know, they're separating you from God. Depends on what you're doing with it. I mean, are you, are you having, is, are, are thoughts being put in your head by the enemy and you're, you're processing them and you're thinking, well, what if I did do that? You know, what if I, what if I was this? What if I told this lie? What if I did that? I mean, that's normal. That's, that's going to happen. That, that's not sin. Um, sin is the action. <laughs> if, if, if an action follows, that's my opinion on it, at least. It's the action that follows. Did you follow through with that thought and carry it out? Now, you, now you've done it. Uh, but I don't think thinking about it is sin. I really, I really reject that. I don't think we have anything that says that <laughs> in scripture. I think we have a lot of pastors that say that. So, all right. So uh, moving on to chapter three. Therefore, holy brothers and sisters who share in the heavenly calling... Fix your thoughts on Jesus, whom we acknowledge is our apostle and high priest. I think, 
I think this is the only place in the entire New Testament where Jesus is referred to as an apostle. I think this is it, and I don't think every version says this. I think some versions say herald here, um, which is really the same thing, because a herald and an apostle mean messenger, both those words, so it's, it's really the same thing, but I think this is it. But apostle meaning messenger, so Jesus is our messenger and he's our high priest. What is his message? Uh, be reconciled to God. It's the same message that we have. It's a message of reconciliation. Uh, the same one that we carry as his ambassadors. So that's, I, th I believe, and that's how I'm interpreting that, that he's our apostle, that he's the one who's carrying the gospel message. We are carrying the gospel message because we're in Christ. It's the same message. I think we have the same message that he, that he has. So um, he's our high priest. Uh, so two terms there that I think are the only places in the New Testament that we see these as apostle, Jesus being an apostle, and then high priest. The only book that ever refers to Jesus as a high priest is the book of Hebrews. It's the only one. Uh, it's very important that we that we know him as a high priest, though, because the high priest's job has always been to take away sins, to atone for sins. Um, that has always exclusively been the responsibility of the high priest and never, ever, 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 ever of the people that he was the high priest over. So what we have done is we have put on the high priest hat in our Christian teachings and we're the high priest. And it's up to us to take away sins through our apologies, through our constant confessions. We act as if we are entering the most holy place and offering blood every time we say, I'm sorry. But that's not what the Old Testament models. In Leviticus chapter 16, which is the instructions for the Day of Atonement, there are very specific instructions for the people of Israel. While the high priest is entering the most holy place and he's offering blood first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people, the people had to stay in their tents and do absolutely nothing. They could not even, they couldn't make food. They couldn't, they couldn't move, essentially. Don't, don't, e don't, even, don't even speak. I mean, be, be extra safe. But the, 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 whole, the whole point of it was, you had to stay in your tent until the priest was done. You could not do anything. Um, what the Holy Spirit is modeling by that is that the high priest, the high priest is the one who, who enters the holy place and propitiates for sin, the ultimate one that's coming, um, the ultimate one that's coming, Jesus Christ. But the, the high priest's job was always to, to take away sins, never the people. The people never had a participation in that. Um, that's, that's why the, the, um, the, the, I think the Day of Atonement was considered a most holy Sabbath. And it sounds so crazy how ridiculously restrictive it was. And if anybody violated this, they were killed. But when we look at that as a, a model for Christ, we kind of understand that when we don't get it, that it's the high priest, and it's always been the high priest that atones for sins and then later on propitiates for sins, which is what Jesus did, um, then we have all kinds of mess, all kinds of messy doctrine after that. And then sin takes a front seat and Jesus takes a back seat. So I think that that's what the Holy Spirit's modeling with the Day of Atonement, that this has always been the high priest's job. It has never been anybody, else, anybody else's job. They can't help. They can't contribute. They can't do anything. It's the high priest. Um, and I think that we see that fulfilled with Christ. So going on here in uh, verse 2, he says, um, He was faithful, this is speaking of Jesus, He was faithful to the one who appointed him, just as Moses was faithful in all of God's house. Jesus has been found worthy of greater honor than Moses, just as the builder of a house has greater honor than the house itself. Uh, the first time I did a Bible study on Hebrews, I called it the Hebrews hit, hit list, I think is what I called this. I think I called it the Hebrews hit list. The reason I called it that is because first, the author of Hebrews has taken a swing at the angels, right? Jesus is greater than the angels. Next up is Moses on the Hebrews chopping block. And also Moses, Jesus is greater than him. And um, sorry, my leg is falling asleep here. And why would he do that? Uh, you know, we, we kind of say, okay, why, why, why? Why the angels? Why Moses? Because he's talking to the Jewish people who really regarded the angels as something special, but no one, no one was regarded with more holiness, more reverence than Moses himself, the man of God who brought them the law. So, so the, the author of Hebrews is saying this Jesus, the son of God, he's greater than Moses, um, just as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. Then he goes on here and he says, uh, for every house is built by someone, but God is the builder of everything. Moses was faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. Moses is pointing forward. That's what the author is, is showing there. Moses is pointing forward. Um, he is not, 
he is not the end. He is not the end result. Um, he is simply a, a, essentially a placeholder. Moses and his ministry is essentially a placeholder until the time of Christ, but really to model the Christ too. Moses really models the Christ, but he's not the Christ and he's not, he's not the, the end here. So he's faithful as a servant in all of God's house, bearing witness to what would be spoken by God in the future. But Christ is faithful as the son over God's house. And here's the real big line right here. And we are his house. If indeed we hold firmly to our confidence in the hope in which we glory, we are his house, the children of God. How many times have you heard a church building referred to as the house of the Lord? I mean, how many times have we heard that? There's a song. There's a song. Um, there's joy in the house of the Lord. Uh, you know, we've all, and what does it say? There's joy in the house of the Lord and we won't be silent, something like that. Um, we are the house of the Lord. Us, you, me, anyone who's ever believed that Jesus is the Son of God, we are the house of God. God is the builder of everything. Moses was a servant, being faithful in all in all of God's house, but Jesus is the Son over that house, and we are the house. That's the new covenant. Um, we are the house of the Lord. We are the church. It's never been a building. It's never been an organization. It's always been the children of God. So uh, going down here in verse 7, he says, So as the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Um, that's not really speaking about us, uh, Gentiles in the flesh. This is talking specifically about the, about the Israelites and their rebellion, that they, um, that specifically the ones that were sentenced to death for the 40 years in the wilderness because of unbelief. And the unbelief was the charge that was, um, that was levied against them, was actually unbelief. I think that growing up... I heard an awful lot about the children of Israel wandering in the desert. I heard that story a ton, like in Sunday school, um, Awana, things like that. I always heard that story. I never, ever heard the context with it. The context was that was a death march. That was because they had not believed in God. God wiped the first generation of, Israel's, of Israel out. He wiped out that entire first generation, the ones that he had led out of Egypt. They were sentenced to death for unbelief. The second generation was allowed to go into the promised land, but only by grace. Only by grace because they didn't deserve to go either. But God pardoned the second generation and allowed them to go into the promised land. The reason that that is so important, and that's what the author of Hebrews is going to get to, is because in this very book, in the epistle to the Hebrews, Jesus Christ becomes allegorical with the promised land. He's the promised land. And only by grace do you enter the promised land. Um, so that is why, and uh, not by un and unbelievers are shut out. So that's why you have this. They 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 perish. So that's why you have this 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 model with these these forty years in the wilderness to kill off the unbelievers. And that's what it was. It's harsh, but that's what it was. It's because you don't enter the promised land from, through unbelief. Um, this is a model of the new covenant that that's coming up here, and it's it's finally explained. This is the first time and only time, I believe. Uh, Jude touches on this briefly, but really the first and only time this is ever explained in the New Testament is what exactly happened there, you know, back with this 40 years wandering in the wilderness. So I always heard the story. I never heard the context. I never, ever heard the context. Always the story, though. So, okay, so today, do not, um, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did during the rebellion, during the time of testing in the wilderness, where your ancestors tested and tried me, though for 40 years they saw what I did. They saw, but they didn't believe. They tested and tried him. They saw what he did, and they never believed. That is why I was angry with that generation. <laughs> it's, um, I remember the first time my wife and I was, were reading this. We're like, well, so finally God sits down and explains why he was, why he was upset. Um, I remember us, us having that conversation. We kind of thought it was, it was a little funny, but we're like, it's almost like an, an interview after the fact. And he's like, and that is why I was angry with that generation. I said, their hearts are always going astray and they have not known my ways. So I declared on oath in my anger, they shall never enter my rest. Speaking of that first generation of Israelites, they're never going to enter. The rest of God is Jesus Christ. The promised land is allegorical for Jesus Christ. They're not going to enter because of unbelief. So he says in um, uh, verse 12 here, See to it, brothers and sisters, that none of you has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. So just to cement that that was talking about unbelief, he says that in verse 12 here, a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. Um, I read a really bad article. I read bad articles all the time. Sometimes I share them with you guys. I read a really bad article. I think this was on Desiring God. Um, I'm going to tell you the blog name because this is a really big, big, um, well-followed blog. It's called Desiring God. I think it's through um, Focus on the Family, I believe so, which uh, has some good stuff and a lot of not so good stuff that they put out. But I think this is where I saw this, that it was a warning against a Christian having a sinful, unbelieving heart using this scripture, taking it 
completely and totally out of context in saying you better watch out that you don't have a sinful, unbelieving heart. Um, I, I was I saw the heading on it and it said something like that in the heading and I clicked on it and I was like this person has zero comprehension of the gospel none whatsoever if they think a Christian a child of God can have a sinful unbelieving heart they have no understanding absolutely none because that can of course never ever ever happen for the children of God we we have a new heart um, we have become obedient from the heart to righteousness we're actually under the control of righteousness uh, the love of Christ controls us is what Second Corinthians says. Uh, the, uh, the idea that this could be about the children of God, that, um, when I see something like that, it, it's just a telltale sign that, and this was somebody who had been through seminary, they had, you know, no, they had um, abbreviations after their name, this is a well-educated person that's saying this, educated in the doctrines of men. I mean, it doesn't, that holds no weight because they don't understand the gospel, they've stumbled over the stumbling block. So, but, but that's the thing. Um, I saw a video on YouTube that was warning Christians about developing a carnal mind. A carnal mind for Christians. We have the mind of Christ. But that was never mentioned, that we have the mind of Christ. Um, and that was never mentioned that the Holy Spirit transforms us through the renewing of our mind. It was ne- that was, those things were never mentioned. It was, you better watch out that you don't have a carnal mind. A sinful mind. A depraved mind, as the NIV says. So, uh, there, there's no uh, shortage of verses like this being used out of context. It's, it's very unfortunate, but there's, there's no shortage of that. So he says here in verse 13, but encourage one another daily as long as it is called today so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. So I guess just kind of go into this this person's argument, okay? Be careful about the sinful, unbelieving heart. Um, no, make sure none of you are hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Most of the, um, most of the epistles have um, evangelistic appeals in them because not everybody who would be reading this would be in Christ. So that's why you have that. You have, you have uh, scriptures like that saying, see to it that none of you um, has a sinful, unbelieving heart that turns away from the living God. It could be, I'm writing to believers and unbelievers. So, you know, and this is kind of speaking to the unbelievers among them. Uh, and he comes down here and he's to 14. He says, uh, we have come to share in Christ if indeed we hold our original conviction firmly to the end. What's the original conviction? I think, and this is the way I'm reading this, I think the gospel, um, he's saying that indeed if we hold that firmly to the end, meaning that there's probably some people here who have taste tested the gospel. Um, They've dipped their foot in the pool, but they haven't gone for a swim, so to speak. Uh, So they have have that, they're kind of kicking the gospel around, but they haven't really believed in Jesus Christ yet. And I think that's what he's talking about. Um, But that would be the original conviction. And he says, you know, if indeed we hold it firmly to the end, kind of sounds like we could lose it. we can't. Uh, 1 Corinthians says it is, it is God who makes you stand firm. Um, as far as standing firm goes, it is, it is Christ who makes you stand firm. So um, he anointed us, uh, set his seal of ownership on us. All, all that scripture that's right there. I think that might be 2 Corinthians. It's one of my live scripture quotations. So you know how those go. But um, regardless, it, we stand firm by faith. It is by faith you stand firm. Um, so, so you know, we don't have to worry about things like that. I know that that's, that's stuff that we get threatened with sometimes, but we're secure in Christ. Um, we have we have the better promises, which is what the author of Hebrews is talking about. So I, I don't think I could ever come to that conclusion by reading the entire letter of Hebrews, but I could come to that conclusion by listening to pastors and teachers that don't understand the gospel, um, which I did in the past. So uh, verse 15 says, and as, it, as it has just been said, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they that heard and rebelled? Were they not all those that Moses led out of Egypt? Yes, the first generation of Israelites. And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies perished in the wilderness? So that first generation of Israelites that wandered for 40 years and then died because of unbelief. And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest, if not those who disobeyed? So important that that word disobeyed is being linked with unbelief here because that's what disobedience means in the New Testament. Likewise, obedience means faith in the New Testament. Disobedience means unbelief. So he's saying in verse 18, he says, And to whom did God swear that they would never enter his rest if not to those who disobeyed? So we see that they were not able to enter because of their unbelief. So he's saying they disobeyed and then he's defining the word disobedience right there. He's saying it's unbelief. They weren't able to enter because of their unbelief. Um, the reason that that's important, I think, to for us just to kind of kind of know that that obedience is always talking about faith, disobedience is always talking about unbelief. In in Second Corinthians, there is actually a, a couple of different uses of those words. Um, we can do a live stream about that sometime, where it's, it's being used in kind of a general sense. But in a spiritual sense, obedience is always faith, and disobedience is always unbelief. The reason I say that um, 
that that's that's just important to kind of kind of know that is because there's this obedience theology out there that you have to be obedient. Are you being obedient to Christ in all things? Are you being obedient in your job, your finances, you know, your church attendance, you name it? It's faith plus works. And it's incorrectly using that word obedience, which obedience is faith. We are all obedient. In fact, Romans 6 says we're obedient from the heart. Um, we are obedient to Christ because we've believed in him, because we have faith in him. Um, and because he's changed us and we are, we are now naturally obedient to him. Uh, our heart is obedient to the pattern of teaching that's now claimed our allegiance. So that is never something that has to be worked for. It's never something to be, oh my gosh, I, I don't know if I was being obedient here or, or there. It's always, we're, we're, the, we're the children of God. It's, it's really a good, it's really a, a safe and secure position to be in, to be the children of God. It's, it's not something that, you know, should have us riddled with anxiety, but it, it unfortunately, unfortunately, because it's, our teachers misunderstand it. Um, a lot of us have bad impre- A lot of us have had. I don't think we do now, but have had really bad impressions of this in the past. So that's the end of chapter three. Let's um, let's stop there, and I will get to your comments here. Let me scroll up to the top. Um, let's see. By grace, new covenant. Good morning. Um, thank you for all the insight regarding Jesus's actual separation. Never heard that way before. Yeah, and, and that's that's my interpretation of it. But I think that makes sense when we're talking about that he tasted death. Sorry, guys, my leg is like really bothering me. It's like falling asleep when I sit on it too long. Um, but when, when we talk about how how he tasted death uh, for everyone um, by the grace of God, by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Death being that separation that's caused by sin. That really is. Um, really throws a wrench in a lot of our theologies, doesn't it? That's that, that we are still in that in that 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 um space with God. The fact of the matter that we can sin and he's actually going to remove himself from us. Something that the New Testament never ever 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 says. Uh, it's completely and totally made up. But we have scripture like this that tells us the opposite. And I think that is it's really just a kind of a good thing to have in our arsenal. Not not something, you know, to beat people over the head with like I used to do with things like this, but something to, to know and to kind of gently say, okay, what, what is your interpretation of this? You know, that by the grace of God, Jesus tasted death for everyone. Like, what, what do you do with that? Um, I would imagine, I don't mean this in a bad way, but um, Hebrews is not well known. It, it just is not. It's, it's the least studied epistle. The least, I think it's the least preached epistle, except when we want people to go to church. Uh, then we'll use Hebrews. What is it? Hebrews ten twenty five or something like that. Um, that that's that's when. And what a shame, because Hebrews ten has such good scripture. You know, there's there's such beautiful scripture in chapter ten, and that's the one we're going to focus on. And that's a fine p- piece of scripture. There's nothing wrong with it. But look what we're ignoring uh, to get to that. That's the same chapter that says we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus. That's the same chapter that says for by a single offering we've been made perfect forever. Um, that's the same. That's that's that same chapter. So, <laughs> um, but that's that's the part of it we like. But but any rate, um, if you're bringing something from Hebrews to somebody, I think chances are they're not going to know it. And like I said, not not saying anything about them, not meaning that in some, some kind of a negative way. But they probably would be hearing that for the first time, just because it is it is just so not. No attention is paid to Hebrews. Um, going down here, uh, Jesus is our older brother. Absolutely love this. He is. That's. The new covenant's a family dynamic. Uh, the old covenant, <laughs> I remember I was I was doing a bit of writing uh, a while back, trying to find easier ways to explain the gospel, and I think a family story is a really easy way to do it because uh, everybody understands family. That's, that's just something that's universally understood by everybody. And I was talking about the old covenant, and I was like, read through Exodus to Deuteronomy and tell me if you get any warm, fuzzy family feelings <laughs> from the Torah. <laughs> And is there any, any, any warm, fuzzy family feelings? Because the old covenant is definitely not a family dynamic. There is nothing family about that. They are not the children of God. They are the children of Israel. They are the servants of God. It's a very different operating system that you have in the Old Testament and the old covenant. New covenant's not like that. It's built on a family dynamic. The father sends his son to the world to, to, to save the world, but really to call out of the world the true children of God, the children of Abraham by faith. Um, it is it is a family dynamic. Jesus is our brother. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, and likewise, we shouldn't be ashamed to call him our brother. Um, that is not well known. So if, if I think, I think, if, if you kind of started going around talking about Jesus as your brother and saying that we're from the same father, he's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters, uh, you're probably going to get some looks and maybe some bad comments because I think religious ears are going to hear that as being, oh, you, how could you ever say you know, that Jesus is your brother, because they're not going to know the scripture. So I think they're going to, they kind of would be put off by that. And what do you mean he's our brother? You know, 
um, you know, he's our Lord, and you know, they're going to have all their their versions. He's our Lord, and you know, we have to make him Lord in all these different areas of our lives and all that type of stuff. But um, he's our brother. He's not ashamed to call us brothers and sisters. I'm not ashamed to call him my brother. Um, just like I'm not ashamed to call you guys my my brothers and sisters. You know, we're we're not we're we're a family. Um, we have the same dad. We have the same dad. We're all from the same father, as Hebrews chapter two says. So, uh, but, but that's the cool thing. I mean, everybody understands, I, I think everybody understands family. And I think, I think teaching the new covenant as a family dynamic is, uh, I think, I think that's, that's a little bit more relatable. I haven't really fleshed all that out yet. Like I said, I was kind of working on, um, I was kind of working on that. That's something I'm kind of working on some teachings in that, in that area. So, um, up north, good morning says, absolutely agree. The devil isn't accusing us. And then that's the thing. I struggle with that because what would he be accusing us of? It would have to be sin. And I guess that if you wanted to put a new covenant spin on that, you could say, well, he's not accusing us before the throne of God because he lost his position in heaven. You know, Revelation 12 says that um, he was triumphed over by the blood of the lamb. When Jesus died, the devil was thrown from the heavenly places. He doesn't have, sin was taken away. So he, he has nothing to, he's a prosecuting attorney that has no charges, has no charges. Um, Romans says, who would bring a charge against God's elect? No one. Um, it is God who justifies, who condemns. No one. No one would dare to do that. The devil would not dare to bring a charge against God's elect. If you wanted to put a new covenant spin on it, you could say, well, he's not, he's not bringing charges before God's throne. He's actually lying to you directly. And that's how he's, you know, the accuser of the brethren. I think that's fine, but scripture doesn't say that. So that's, I think that's fine to say because it, it makes sense to me but we don't have any scripture that does say it. So that's that's kind of where I get stuck with it a little bit. Um, but going down here, um, by Grace New Covenant says, the adversary and his consorts are already defeated once for all, just as we are saved and sanctified once for all. I think so too. I think that's true. Uh, this is once for all time. All of it happened at the cross. The cross changed everything. Um, you know, it's so interesting about the cross. It, it's uh, because the cross... Um, is, is kind of it's an eternal event. Um, scripture Scripture talks about this that, that the Lamb of God was crucified before the foundation of the of the of the earth. So it's an eternal event, and it's hard for our minds to understand that. But the cross actually changed the past and the future. It it actually did, <laughs> because the cross goes all the way back to the beginning of time and covered everyone who ever believed in God and had their faith credited to them as righteousness. Um, and Hebrews chapter eleven teaches that. And says that together with us, they were made perfect. The Old Testament saints, together with us, they were made perfect. Um, and they were all brought in by the blood of Christ. So he actually, the cross actually changes the past. And then it changes everything in the future. So it, it's, it's so interesting. Um, we, could, we could do all kinds of talks about that, about everything that, you know, that we know of that was changed at the cross. But it was absolutely everything. Absolutely everything changed at the cross uh, once for all time. So, but that's how big the Son of God is. That's just how, that's the, that's the majesty of Christ. Up north says the cross finished everything. <laughs> Honor God's grace. Good morning. Uh, Satan has been given the boot. I, I, that's pretty funny. Yeah, he's been given the, the boot emoji. Um, so uh, by grace new covenant says, I absolutely agree. The adversary and the consorts don't have any significance to believers anymore. Um, whatso uh, the whatsoever the way I understand it so far, but the point being people need to know that. I think so too. Um, I, I think so too. And I think we don't know that because we put so much focus on sin and sinning and the devil. My goodness, do we have focus on the devil? I unfortunately went down that road the whole first uh, two years of my ministry, which I've deleted everything from that, but was all about the devil. You know, you better stop sinning or the devil's going to get you. I was very involved in deliverance ministries. Uh, so yeah, I mean, he's, I, I, we do, we put a lot of focus on that, which is un unfortunate because scripture does not give the devil a lot of focus. So, uh, 7 a.m. says, um, amen, we are the descendants of Abraham by faith. Yes, absolutely, we are. We are the children of Abraham. It has nothing to do with physical descent, but to those who share the faith of Abraham. Um, uh, so, uh, up north says, I agree, a thought thought are the tennis court we have to smack thoughts um uh, over over the net i think instead of acting on them that's that's a good metaphor up north i like that um uh, by grace new covenant says relatable also understanding his life circumstances as a, as a human being so i think that's talking about that scripture that says he had to be made like us fully human in every way so that he could be a merciful and faithful high priest in service to god um absolutely yeah and i i think i that's how i read that is it's, it's he's relatable He's relatable because he was tempted in every single way. Um, he is our older brother. It is a family, um, and we can relate to him. And he can relate to us likewise. Um, he can relate to us likewise. So 
something that you didn't have in the old covenant. You know, in the old covenant, you didn't have that. You had a holy God and you had unholy people. Um, what fellowship can there be between light and darkness? Um, what, what, what harmony is there between a believer and an unbeliever? Um, what harmony between Christ and Belial is, I think, 2 Corinthians talks about that. But really the first one, what fellowship can there be between light and darkness? Uh, none. Zero. And that's what you had modeled in the Old Covenant. You have God who is light, the people who are darkness. Um, they're not going to get along well. <laughs> they're not, they're not going to relate well. Um, but now we are in the light as he is in the light. Uh, that's what First John says. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. First John uh, chapter 1 says that. We are in the light as he is in the light. We were once darkness, but now we are the light, and we are now we are light in the Lord. We're compatible with God. Um, we're whereas he is. Um, he's made us like him. So there can be fellowship between light and light, and there is perfect fellowship between us and our Father. So uh, going down here, um, let's see what else we got here. <laughs> Hit list, no wonder this letter wasn't signed. Amber, you know what I thought of this morning when I was reading through Hebrews? Okay, picture this. What if, what if an old copy of Hebrews was found from the first century, okay, and it was signed, and the author was a woman? Wouldn't that just blow, like, religious gaskets all over this country if that happened? Uh, Hebrews would be kicked out of the Bible. I'm, I'm convinced that if, if that were the case, in some, because in, sexism is so powerful in our churches, I think that in some, in some denominations and stuff, Hebrews would be gone. I mean, Hebrews would be given the boot at that point because it's the whole thing is wrong now uh because it was because it was written by a woman but i was thinking about that i was like what if that happened because we don't know who the author was this could have been written by a woman it might might have been um but what if what if that was the case what if that was the case i i just thought that was funny because one of the um one of the candidates for being the author of hebrews is priscilla apparently there's some ancient talk about that that's that's the, that's the scuttlebutt that there was some ancient talk about that that priscilla had actually written the letter to the hebrews um, we don't know that for a fact, but uh, but wouldn't that be great? I would love that. I, w I would. I think that was the funniest thing <laughs> if that happened. But I I think that it, it would yeah it would just lead to further discredit uh, crediting of Hebrews though than we already have. So uh, going down here um, by grace new covenant says God wiping out the first generation. Um, also regarding the slave mentality, Egypt versus freedom in Christ, grace through faith. Oh, tr true. Yeah, and, and they're choosing they're choosing Egypt over over freedom, over the promised land. Yeah, that's another good way to look at it too. Um, what did Stephen say? And was this when Acts chapter seven? Whenever Stephen gets killed, didn't he say that in their hearts the Israelites turned back to Egypt? Didn't he say something like that? Um, kind of almost allegorical for for like sin for unbelief. A little bit. I think that's how he uses that when he's making his testimony. I think I think Stephen says that. I think so. Uh, but but yes, that that's a very good observation by Grace New Covenant. I think that's really good. Amber says, but oh how they abuse the word um, obedience. Uh, oh my goodness, how do they ever abuse the word obedience? Everything is about your obedience because everything is about you and nothing is about Jesus. So why not um, have you be obedient in all areas of your life? And you never will be. It's something you're working toward. You'll always be working toward it. They say. Um, and you know, what's going to be used as examples and teachings on this is old Testament characters. They're going to say, well, you need to be obedient. Like, well, probably not Jonah. He's the first person that popped into my mind. I was like, he wasn't very obedient. Probably be obedient like Abraham or be obedient like Noah or, or David, maybe, although David is also kind of sporadic with that. But regardless, they're going to be, they're going to prop up old Testament characters and say, you need to be like them, ignoring the scripture that says that they needed to be like us. It's the opposite. Uh, we need to go back in time and try to move into the old recon um, unreconciled world of the Old Testament and fancy ourselves Jews living under the Old Covenant. That's what we need to do. Um, that's unfortunate. But because the difference between the old and the new is not understood, and we think this is all one giant thing, it's all about the children of God, uh, we get bad teachings like that. So uh, going down here, David says, Happy rising, everyone. Let's enjoy our freedom in Christ. I went yesterday to my parents' establishment, uh, church, I think, and boy, did it feel like two steps back. All I can do is love. So true that we are the house of God. It's hard to sit through those. I mean, I mean, David, I imagine it's especially personal to you. I don't know if you like grew up in that church or um, you, you probably have a long history with it, I'd imagine, since it's your parents' church. But uh, but it's hard. You know, m um, my, my wife and I actually stopped going to church because we just could not take any more of the gospel being butchered. 
on stage. We just couldn't take it. We were trying to to be positive and everything, but it ended up taking it taking out of us. Like, for example, I was leaving every single service upset because of because of the mishandling of the gospel, because of the belittlement of Jesus Christ. I was I was leaving every single service upset, and I I kind of started being like, why am I even doing this? Like, what what am I even doing here? You know, I'm I'm coming here. We're, we're, we're doing this because I don't know, I guess we, we kind of thought we had to at that time, but this is just making me upset. You know, this is, this isn't doing anything. Um, I wasn't being edified. You know, I was just, I was just sitting there writing down all the things that I thought were, <laughs> were wrong or, you know, whatever I was doing there. But, but I, I, I was just like, you know what, maybe my time is better spent not here, not here. So, and I, and we could never find them. We've never found a grace church to this day. We've never found one. So we watch them online and we're always horrifically, I disappointed and it's it's nothing against the people it is absolutely nothing against the people david like you're saying all i can do is love um amen all, all you can do is love full of grace seasoned with salt but it becomes exhausting after after a little while it also with me it hits a particular trigger point that i'm trying to mature away from but um i myself personally and many of my family members were really 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 hurt by religion and um, some of them still are to this day and the fallout of that is still so present to this day um i have i have several family members that i'm not sure are in christ because the because the church did such a number on them um they are so angry they are so frustrated and um they they're in, they're so bitter toward god toward jesus toward everything because of their church career so it hits a certain trigger point with me and i see these pastors up on stage and they're butchering the gospel every way that you can butcher the gospel and i'm i i you know i i can i can see both sides i can look at them and say okay well they're they're just they're just immature they're just ignorant you know they're it's just that that's all it is they they mean well um they say they're not meaning to do this what they're doing here the other part of me says yes but it's no gospel at all and it's the other part of me is the galatians uh chapter one part where i'm like let them be under god's curse uh, this is no gospel at all to heck with them get them out of here you know get us out of here um move away from them because and, and so I, ha I have both. I'm, I'm, I'm wrestling with both of those because I want to be a good minister to people that are caught in religion like that. I mean, that's really why I started my ministry was to do that. Um, but at the same time, I'm kind of, I kind of start getting upset with the teachers that are teaching that. I start, I start getting upset with them. And I start, I kind of start feeling like my, um, my um, zealous uh, tendencies start to rise a little bit where I'm like, I'm going to go debate this person. I'm going to tell them, okay, you need to point that out to me in scripture. Like, I'm going to, I'm going to get them. And then I'm like, no, 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 I'm not. You know, I'm trying to like walk myself back. So, so I, I, have, I have stuff I got to work through with that because I, I don't know. I, I have, I, that's like I said, that's just where I'm at. I have to work through that because I can very quickly see myself going in a bad direction with it too. So I'm trying, I'm, I'm striving for the full of grace season with salt. It's hard for me with teachers, with pastors who are, who are, who are the leaders of these flocks that are, that are not, um, that are teaching all the wrong things, all the wrong things. So um, going down here, um, David says, people naturally judge the next person when salvation is achieved by performance. Of course. Yeah, of course, because some people are going to be ahead of you. I mean, it's always, it's always going to be that. There's going to be a ranking system. So that is going to, that is going to breed judgment. Yes, absolutely it would. Um, going down here. Uh, yes, that would be a great reason not to, uh, to sign. <laughs> uh, yeah, not, not to sign. Yep. Um, obedient when, uh, when we do it is like digging in the sand, digging in the sand. <laughs> that's a good, uh, that's a good analogy. Uh, manual. Very good. Yeah. Fancy ourselves Jews, brother. You're on a flow. <laughs> Love it. Well, I think we do a little bit, you know, when we, when we go to the old Testament and I get it, um, character stories are very relatable. I understand that. Um, but unfortunately those are not relatable situations. Uh, you know, when we hear stories about people, you, you can relate really easily to that. You can kind of put yourself in those shoes. It's easy to do. That's just because we're humans. But I think we have to understand the world is so different than it was then. The world was unreconciled then. Now all created things have been reconciled to God through the cross. That is so different than the world of the Old Testament was. Um, there are no, there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles. There's one new humanity that was brought in by the blood of the cross, Ephesians chapter 2 says. So, so it's so different that it's not relatable. And that's what, whenever I say this, um, I have a, a Bible study with, with my family, uh, on Sundays, we do a Bible study and they, they have come a long way, but some of them are still a little, a little, not, not liking that kind of a statement. You know, when you would say that about the, about the old Testament, that this really is not relatable. Um, 
So they don't say anything anymore. They used to they used to kind of like get upset with that, and now they kind of just are like they don't say anything. They're just kind of quiet with it. But the reason I keep bringing that up is because I I see them doing that so often. Oh, we're we're just like David, or we're just like Noah, or we're just like no, the heck we're not. We are just like us, the children of God, and everything how the New Testament describes the children of God. That's what we're like. Jesus in this world, we're like him. That's who we're like. We're not like these Old Testament people. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says we are not like Moses. We're not like him with the fading glory that he had, the glory that was not his own. We have the glory of the Son of God. It's ever increasing. We're not like Moses. Uh, we're not like him. So, so I, I bring those things up and I, I just I do it gently, but I want them to constantly be hearing that. That is not the case. We are not like them. I want them to be free of that, of that, of that bondage by relating with Old Testament Jews or just Old Testament people in general, um, situations that are really not relatable. That's, that's not their story. Um, what's going on here? Uh, David says, I only go because I have five sisters that I love. I go for them. But after I leave, I'm always stressed. Our times are definitely better spent with family on Sundays. Yeah, it's so hard. I mean, when you when you have the gospel and we have Jesus being belittled, that's so hard um, not to be upset by that. It's, it's so hard because it's like, it's, it's, it's sad. I have multiple emotions. I'm really sad. I'm saddened by it, but then I'm angry. I have like a mixture. And then I'm like, I'm not, I'm not upset with the people. I'm kind of mad at the teacher. That's where I'll start to get, I'll be like, oh, come on. You should, you really should know better. And then I'll kind of want to go talk to them. And I'll, there's a lot of, like I said, the religious, the, the zealot parts. I got to kind of like suppress that whenever I hear the, the gospel, um, being like that, because here's the thing. And this is what I learned the hard way. If I go kick the door down and say, you got to show me that in scripture, and I know it's not in there, you know, I, I can get them on the scripture. But um, if I do that, uh, they're never going to listen to me and I'm not going to have the results I want. And everybody loses. Every, absolutely everybody loses w- with that approach. So what I'm trying to do is be more mature and build a relationship with the person first and then maybe gently have that conversation with them. But that's, those things take time. I get impatient with it. I get angry. So it's all, all things I have to, um, all things I have to mature with. So uh, Amber says it's a trigger point for her too. Yeah, it is. It's, I think it's probably a trigger point for a lot of us. We have Christ in us. Um, we we um, are just fully embracing the unadulterated gospel. And I think when we hear, when we hear the adulterated gospel, we're just like it's nails on a chalkboard, a fork on a dinner plate. You know, we just, we can't stand it. We just can't stand it. So um, we love the people, but we can't stand that mixed message. Um, yes, our swoop tendencies tend to, <laughs> Uh, tend to be aggressive passion. It's hard with teachers and pastors because they can't be taught. Yeah, they they don't. They're not really receptive to that, are they? Because they've been through the the system. They've been through all the all the proper accreditations that they've received, and they're really not going to listen to us because we don't have those things. You know, I don't have a seminary degree. Um, I don't have I don't I don't have a college degree. I don't I don't even have, I don't even have an associate's degree. I don't have anything. I have a high school education. That's it. Um, you know, so they're they're going to look at me. Oh, okay, what does he know? You know, and that, I, I can see that they're they're not gonna they're not gonna want to learn from me. They're gonna be okay. Well, that that person's crazy. He doesn't know what he's talking about. He he just doesn't have a good understanding. You know, and okay, but the gospel is really a simple message. Uh, I was reading First Corinthians yesterday, and uh, Paul was saying that he came to the Corinthian church with fear and trembling, and he he knew nothing besides Jesus Christ and Him crucified, but he founded the church on that on that message, Jesus Christ and him crucified. He founded the entire Corinthian church on that. He said, I didn't know anything besides that. Um, that's enough. That's all you need though. Look at how effective he was. Uh, they moved away from that, which is why we have first Corinthians, but look what he did with Jesus Christ and him crucified because that's, that's, that's it. That's the, that's the wisdom of God. Um, that's the gospel. He knew the gospel. That's all you need. We all know the gospel. Um, we don't have to be theological wizards. And honestly, a lot of these pastors and teachers that fancy themselves theological wizards are not theological wizards. They are very familiar with the teachings and doctrines of men, but they are not familiar with the scriptures. Um, I, I run into that a lot, especially when I read their articles. I mentioned Desiring God earlier. If you read that blog, and I'm not picking on them or anything, there's some good stuff on there too, but if you read that blog, it's a very popular blog, um, just look at how many times theologians are quoted. And just look at how many times anything outside of scripture is quoted. Um, look at how many times scripture is quoted in there. There, It's unbelievable. You'll have a shred of scripture and you'll have paragraph upon paragraph upon paragraph of opinions. And then you'll have multiple theologian quotations is what you have in there. And that's considered wisdom doing that. 
So it's it's tough. Those are our teachers. You know, that's that's the establishment Christianity. Those are our teachers. That's that's a tough arena to navigate in with that because we don't I don't think we study based on okay, let's look this up in scripture and let's use scripture to interpret scripture. It's let's look up what um, Charles Spurgeon said about this, and let's cross-reference that with Martin Luther, and let's let's take a little bit of C.S. Lewis, and now let's build a doctrine. Um, so it's so I, I it, it's hard, it's hard, it's hard for us to navigate that. It's hard for us to to operate in that arena. Um, coming down here, up north says Sundays we go out, um, we go hand ice cold water to the street kids in our city, a cup of cold water in Jesus' name. That's really nice. That's really nice. That's that's a that's a great ministry. I don't know if you're talking to them about Christ or not, but even acts of kindness, you don't really need to say anything. You're an ambassador of Christ, so everybody understands kindness. It's universal language. So that's that's a really that's a really cool thing you're doing. Uh, get a get a pillow next time. The floor ain't no joke. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you're not kidding, Manuel. I, I, my leg keeps falling asleep here. I'm probably gonna do that tomorrow. <laughs> Um, Natalie, if I'm saying that right, I think it's Natalie. If I don't ever, if I don't say your, um, your, your screen name is cause I don't, I don't know how to pronounce it, but I think, I think it's Natalie. If I'm saying it wrong, I'm sorry. Um, says in our church, you are a sinner and then you are a saint. Well, duh, which one are we? You can't be both. It's you're a sheep or you're a goat, you're light or you're darkness. Um, you're in Christ or you're in Adam. Scripture is deals and absolutes. When it comes to that, there is never a middle ground. There is not a shred of scripture that speaks about a middle ground. It does not exist. You are one or you are the other. Uh, so if somebody's teaching you both sinner and a saint or something like that, oh, you have some Jekyll and Hyde, you got a split identity, you got something like that going on. No, you don't. Um, we just don't have that scripture. We just don't have that. That is somebody's opinion. Uh, probably somebody who doesn't understand the gospel well. Because the reason that we hang on to sinner is because we say we still sin. And also, you, you still sin, so you're a sinner. Um, you're not. That is who you were, is what scripture says. First Corinthians 6, that is who you were. You've been washed, you've been sanctified, you've been justified. You're not your behaviors, you're not your actions, you are in Christ. That's who you are. So, it's. Uh, but it is a common teaching, like you're saying. Absolutely, very, very common. Um, I'm from the Caribbean and it's a lot of double talk. Uh, that's, that's too bad to hear. Um, it's everywhere though. It's, it's absolutely everywhere. Um, it's uh, double talk is so rampant. The reason that we have to have double talk is because I think it's because we're mixing the old and the new Testament. You know, they're not compatible. You have the ministry of death and the ministry of life that you're mixing. You're mixing those two things together. The only result you could ever get would be double talk because there, there's two different messages. One is a message of death and one is a message of life. You're blending these together and coming up with a death life. Um, those are pretty opposite. When you say life and death are pretty opposite, when you say light and darkness are pretty opposite, so there's no middle ground. Uh, you know, we're, we're, we're forcing that to happen. We're forcing that to happen. So I think double talk is the only result that could come out of that. Um, in the Caribbean, uh, is is you're saying, uh, Natalie, but but it's everywhere. I mean, it's it's it's, it's everywhere you go. Unfortunately, uh, the devil and, and the demonic are everywhere, and they're manipulating our doctrines everywhere. It's it's so it's so um, it's so sad. I'm sad. I'm sorry to to hear that you're you're experiencing that. It's um, it's the common. It's it's the common. It's the common wisdom. Common common uh, knowledge. So uh, David says, what the heck is Apostles Doctrine? A pastor told me that. I don't know off the top of my head. I, I know this, that early on, this is like in the first century, there was a book that was a doctrine of the apostles. Um, let me look this up really quickly. I, let me see if I can find it. If not, we, I'll, get, I'll have it for you tomorrow. Um, but there was, a, there was a, a book that was like um, basically taught alongside the Bible that was about the, the teachings of the apostles, allegedly. Teaching of the apostles. It has a name, too. Oh, what the heck was that called? Let's see if I can find it real quick. Well, I don't think I can. I'll, I might shoot it to you in a message, David, because I think it's going to take me a while to find that. But that's all I know about it, is that there was such a thing at some point that was that was considered to be like a um, an addition to Scripture, and it was, it was circulated for quite some time. Maybe that's what he's talking about. Um, by Grace New Covenant says, I'll take your teachings over well-studied teachers who don't understand the gospel of Christ any day. I appreciate that. And likewise, um, I, I will, you know, all of us know the gospel. So anytime we're speaking about the gospel, I, I think that's more valuable than any seminary degree. Um, a seminary degree that's not, that wasn't focused on Jesus Christ, you know, that wasn't, that wasn't focused on him, that was all about traditions and teachings of men and things like that. Um, 
I would just fellowship with my brothers and sisters any day and make a big deal out of Jesus, our older brother, um, than, I, than, than go to a church that doesn't understand that. Um, the last church service that I watched was Romans 7. It was that church in the town I'm moving to. was was uh, about Romans 7, and it was about um, how we're sinners with sinful natures, and we have to fight off the flesh. And I was like, stop it, stop it, stop it, stop it. And I was all fired up, and I was all mad, and that's when we did that dissection of Romans 7 the next day. But, but I, yeah, I'd rather fellowship with you guys any day than, than go to a church that uh, doesn't understand uh, the gospel. It's just, it's just so disheartening. So, but all right, um, thanks, guys. Thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate you guys being here and sharing all your thoughts. Uh, tomorrow we will pick up Hebrews chapter 4 and work on through that. So uh, thanks so much. Have a great day, and I'll see you soon. Bye.